Good evening and welcome. I'm Eitan Zemmel, Vice Dean on Triumph, and it is my great honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, General Stanley McChrystal. The first time I personally met a general was as a freshly minted officer in the Israeli army. The topic was leadership by example, and the speaker was a military hero, General Moshe Dayan. Just like our speaker tonight, by the time General Dayan addressed our group, he was already a hero. With his very distinct black eye patch, he was universally recognizable, and his aura as a brilliant strategist and as a maverick created a palpable sense of anticipation in the audience. The gentleman who introduced him was eager to give him all due credit and acknowledgement. So he went on and on, listing all the general's assignments and accomplishments. After this went on for quite a while, somebody in the back room stood up and started hollering. Hey, mister, we all know who the general is. Who the hell are you? <laughs> so I'll be brief. The topic we address tonight is leadership. I know that this topic is foremost on your minds. In fact, many of you have joined us at Triumph precisely because you know that you can't do much more and be much more, especially in a global role. In a Triumph, we learn about leadership from each other. Just this past year in Shanghai, we learned about the military view of leadership from our colleague Kurt Cronin, Triumph class of 13. But Kurt is not alone. Indeed, from its very beginnings, Triumph has had a core of high achieving military leaders in every class. Here today, in addition to Kurt, we have Lou Evans, Triumph class of 13, and Mike Scardom, Triumph class of 14. Without exception, they have represented an unbroken chain of brilliant, respected, and beloved colleagues. Our speaker tonight exemplifies the best of that same tradition. Stanley McChrystal is a retired four-star general. He's a tough and brilliant soldier, a deep thinker, and a fearless military innovator. He had served as the commander of the Counterterrorism Joint Special Operation Force and as the commander of the International Security Force in Afghanistan. He is a co-founder and partner of the McChrystal Group, a leadership consulting company, and is the author of a recent memoir, my share of the task. Think a minute about the title. It tells you everything you need to know about the man. Modesty, commitment to leadership as a partnership, and the recognition that 90% of leadership is plain old hard work. It's a task. Ladies and gentlemen of Triumph, I give you General Stanley McChrystal. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I had the opportunity to serve in combat with Kurt Cronin, and so I learned what awesome is. Yes. <laughs> then... <laughs> Then we started a business together, but every couple of months he disappeared. And he said he was in an academic program, but I didn't believe him. <laughs> so I'm here to call his bluff. And if you are paid actors just to, to fool me tonight, then it's a lot of trouble. Thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me be here. It's really exciting for me. I love to talk about leadership because I believe that I got to see great leadership in my life, in my career. I got to see people who led me. I got to see, some were senior to me, some were junior. I admired my father very deeply. And so I became convinced that the biggest difference between two organizations is a quality of leadership. 
And I write in my book that I believe that you can take the top leaders, the top two leaders in an infantry battalion of about 600 people in the best battalion in a division and switch it with the worst. And in 90 days, the worst will become the best and vice versa because leadership is that big a deal. So I think that it's special that you all have been studying this as part of the program. And we'll talk a little bit about one aspect of it tonight. You know, what we talk about in business often is competitive advantage. If we were talking about that in war, we'd tend to use a different term. We'd say the decisive edge. But essentially, it means the same thing. It is the difference between winning and losing. So that's the question you always ask yourself. What's it take to win? And it doesn't mean winning in combat. It may mean winning in business. It may mean educating children. It may mean whatever it is your area is, but it's succeeding in the task in front of you. What do you have to do that? And it's not as straightforward as people think. You know, typically, if you want to win, you do several things. You try to get great talent. This picture, of course, is from Yale, where I teach. We try to get the best technology available, try to have a, an edge. And of course, we try to get the best tactics. We try to operate better than our competition. And if you can get it, if you can get more technology, more wealth, more everything, use it. That's great. But what I would argue is it's pretty hard to keep that edge. As the United States found, in 1975 in Vietnam, although we were the most powerful nation in the world, in April of 1985 or 75, we left Vietnam in defeat, in failure. America used to make a lot of televisions. The last television was manufactured in America a few years ago. When I went into Iraq, it looked easy. By the time we had been there a few years, it was extraordinarily hard. Although we were dominant militarily, dominant economically, stable, the task proved very difficult because the competition was different than we were prepared for. And even recently in Benghazi, you can be surprised by something that happens even though you believe that you are dominant. And even if you are dominant at one point, like the United States was at the end of the Second World War with nuclear power, it doesn't last. If you are dominant economically, it's not going to last. What you see through history is things come and go, they rise and fall, they wax and wane. And now, with China's feeling of an aircraft carrier, it signals another change. That's natural. It happens. It shouldn't be something that we resent or we're surprised about. It should be something that in every field we expect and we adapt to. So I'm going to ask you, shouldn't we think about it a little differently? Instead of strictly in the, the traditional thing, sense thinking about talent, shouldn't we be thinking about trust? And of course, I love the story of William Tell the son who would trust his father enough to stand while an arrow is shot close to his head. Of course, most people don't know he had an older brother. <laughs> See, we learn something in every talk. And maybe instead of trying to be dominant in technology, what we ought to be doing is thinking about being dominant in teamwork. Learned something else here. This is Kurt Cronin some years ago before he joined this course. <laughs> and instead of trying to have the best tactics in the world, what about timing? Sometimes timing is the difference. You know, we, in, in my world, in the military, we grew up worshiping coordination. How coordinated could we be? How synchronized could we be? And in, a, in industry around the world, particularly with the start of the industrial age, think about how much time and effort was taken to perfect 
coordination of activity. But coordination, I would argue, no matter how good it is, probably doesn't describe the things that you see when you see a really great organization doing something different. I think it takes something else. Think about the best things you've seen in life. Best schools, best organizations, best companies. Did coordination describe them? Sometimes it rises above coordination. This is a famous picture of American football in the early 1960s. This is the power sweep of the Green Bay Packers. And a coach named Vince Lombardi took a very simple set of football plays and he took a team and they were dominant in football. It wasn't more complex than his foes. It wasn't even just better coordinated. There was something else to it. So here's the thesis of what I tell you. Success in competitive environments, and if you don't expect to operate in a competitive environment, don't worry about it. It's going to take levels of coordination that only come in people and organizations that have something above that. And what we call it is shared consciousness and purpose. So this is the concept that I think really is central to organizations that are much, much better than the norm. And how did I arrive here? I started in an organization that really tried to focus on talent. I graduated from West Point. Military placed great faith in raising talent. I placed great faith in recruiting talent. That's my wife. We've been married 35 years. So it went OK. But you know, you really have to grow together. That's the last time I've let my wife handle a sword anywhere near me. <laughs> and then the Army takes you and trains you. It tries to develop that talent. And it does in most of the businesses that we're in. And we try to leverage technology. We still do. We try to get that dominance in technology. And we train and try to get dominance in tactics. In 1976, something happened, and it'll resonate with some of you, which changed much of the rest of my career. I was just graduating from the military academy. And in Uganda, a mission occurred of special operating forces that set a direction that impacted me. A number of Israeli and other citizens were in a hijacked aircraft that went to Entebbe in Uganda, in Uganda, and they were held hostage. The Israeli government made a decision to do a daring rescue mission. It flew C-130 aircraft, landed on the airfield, moved, and this commando force then moved from that part, of, from the remote part of the airfield to the terminal tower and was able to rescue the hostages. It was an extraordinary operation. We watched that. And for years in my career, we went to perfect an operation called airfield seizures. We would do a drop of 34 paratroopers onto an airfield. Everything was done with night vision goggles. We had helicopters. The aircraft were all completely blacked out. We operated through the evening, and we trained this over and over. In my career over about 20 years, I probably was on 400 of those complex missions. We got so good that we could drop people on an airfield, and within 90 minutes, we could land the aircraft, secure the airfield completely, bring in a rescue force to do another mission, then fill the aircraft again and take back off and be gone. So 90 minutes from start to finish, and we were gone. We took it almost to an art form. It became like a ballet. It was so complex and so well coordinated. But in my entire career, even after 10 years of war, in the last decade, we never once did that mission. So we took to the highest possible level something that was great, and we learned a lot of other things, but it really wasn't what we needed to do. So here I am. I'm a colonel in the Ranger Regiment in the US Army. 
This is right before I got selected to be a Brigadier General. And I'm feeling very good about myself because when you're at that level, I'm in a good unit. I've been selected for Brigadier General. I think I figured out all the things about my business. Nobody can teach me much because I've been successful enough to think I don't want anything to change. So then what happens? I was doing a parachute jump on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. I was in a, actually in an airplane doing a parachute jump when we got word that the first World Trade Tower had been hit by a passenger plane. I jumped, landed on the ground, and a young sergeant found me and he said, sir, a second plane hit the second World Trade Tower and a bomb went off at the Pentagon because that's what we thought the situation was. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He goes, sir, I think everything's changed. And for my life for the next decade, and for much of America and much of the world, an awful lot did change. I became part, became commander of a special operations force task force. It was a group of highly trained counter-terrorist forces, SEALs, commandos, rangers, all tasked to go after Al-Qaeda and the associated movements that attacked the United States and at which we were then at war. We had trained for years against terrorist threats, but this one was culturally difficult to understand. One, we didn't have enough study, we didn't understand it well enough, and it was different from anything we'd seen before. If you think earlier in my life, people used to hijack an aircraft, take it somewhere, and make demands. They said, give me money, release our comrades from prison, and we will give you the hostages back. We might do that sometimes. Sometimes there'd be a rescue attempt with different outcome, but this was different. And it was geographically spread. Instead of having a small, narrow element that's trying to get one specific thing, one specific demand, this was geographically spread in many areas. And it changed constantly. In the years that I fought Al-Qaeda, it was different every month. How they operated, how they communicated, in many ways what they how they led. And they were this constantly morphing network. They weren't a rigid organization with Osama bin Laden at the top and then a series of lieutenants. And they operated differently. I talked about what used to happen when terrorists would hijack an airplane and make demands. It was almost a business agreement. I will do this, you meet my demands. There was nothing business-like about flying planes directly in, killing people, and then simply saying, we did it. How do you like it? It was difficult to get our minds around. And I had been part of this very, very highly trained commando organization with precision capability to do Entebbe-like operations, and suddenly we have this very large, difficult-to-understand challenge, competition, and there was a capability gap because we weren't big enough, we weren't complex enough, we didn't have enough capabilities to actually deal with it. And in, in our government, although we had different elements, we had intelligence agencies, we had law enforcement agencies, we had military agencies, and facing an element like this, we found that each of us brought much to the fight. And in the early years of the fight against Al-Qaeda, each of our elements tried to take it on alone. And you say, why would you do that? Why would the CIA try to fight it? Why would JSOC try to fight it? What others? It's organizational behavior that I saw. Organizations like to stay cohesive and tribal. They sometimes like to get credit for things. They don't want to cooperate if, in fact, they think they can do it themselves. And cooperation has to be caused through a number of things. And it wasn't working for us. In 2004 and 2005 in Iraq, the multinational force to which the United States was the major player in was losing. We didn't come out and say it's losing. The way the military says that is we're not winning yet. That's a euphemism for losing. 
That's like a corporation that says we're not yet profitable. But it was horrific. The number of civilians being killed by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and his network was staggering. Every day we would come out and there would be bodies, heads, tortured, people of every age. It was difficult to understand or even describe. So how do you do it? How do you deal with it when you suddenly got a problem that's bigger and different than you're ready for? Do you do what you've always done? Are we going to shoot straighter and fly faster? We're already very, very good. Do we try to gather more intelligence? I mean, if you think about it, we try to do those things which we're doing and just work harder. How often have you been in a situation where your organization's operating and it's not doing what you want and you say, well, we just redouble efforts? Or you as a, a leader, you're not getting everything done, so what's the first thing you do? You work harder so you stop sleeping as much, you stop spending time with your kids, you don't eat right, you don't exercise, because you think if I just put it on a little bit more, it'll work. Reminder. It's about winning. Now, people can say that's obvious. Got it. We're about winning. I don't think it's obvious. And I'll tell you why. In August of 2004, my organization, of which Kurt was a part, did precision raids against high-value targets or senior leaders in al-Qaeda in Iraq and other location. We did 18 raids in August of 2004. That was about every other night. That was a pace, it's a small force, that was a pace we never thought we could have done. Years before, if you said we're going to do 18 raids in one month, we'd have said impossible. They were great, they were precision, they were as good as anyone had ever done in history as a military force, and faster than we ever thought we'd have to. But yet, violence continued to go up dramatically. The situation continued to get worse. So what happens when you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do and you're doing it really well? In fact, you're even doing it better than you ever have before. But the result is not coming out the way you want it. So we took action. In August of 2006, same force, same fight, same country, did 300 raids in a month. Now think about that mathematically. That's 10 raids a night. This is a force that used to do an Entebbe-like raid once every six months. Suddenly we're doing it 10 times a night. Every member of the force is going on a raid every night. It was stunning to us. We had to change completely the way we operated because you couldn't be centralized. You couldn't take time. You couldn't be deliberate. You had to trust people. You had to push things down. And we came out with what we called collaborative warfare. It meant everything was about being a network, pumping information so that everybody could operate with independent flexibility, but with combined shared knowledge or shared consciousness, as we called it. You couldn't go up a hierarchical system. It wasn't fast enough. So this is what we came out with. We decided it was shared consciousness and purpose. This became the answer. It wasn't shooting straighter. It wasn't lifting more weights. It wasn't being better commandos. But if I had gotten in front of our commando force, put this on a screen and said, man, this is what we're going to do, they'd have beaten me up and taken my lunch money. <laughs> because it's countercultural. You grow up in a thing and say, this is what makes you good. And suddenly someone says, no, the thing that really makes you good is cooperating with everybody else. Think psychologically, when, when you've spent a career building expertise in one thing, and to be successful, you've got to be something entirely different. This is what we think it meant. This is how we define it. Shared consciousness means everybody gets access to all the information. It's not just at one level or at bottom level. You give it all. We did a 90-minute video teleconference every day for five years across the entire command. So everybody could hear. They could hear what I thought. They could hear what people at every level thought. They may not come to the same conclusions with the information, but they got it all. 
The people in the top of the organization no longer have special organization information that they don't share. And everybody owns the problem. And this gets back to it's about winning. We had to define winning. Winning is not how well one part of the organization does. You can't, in, in our American baseball, you can't have a high batting average and have your team lose and be a winner. In soccer or football, you can't score goals personally and if your team loses and still think you had a good season because it's irrelevant. It's only about winning. And so what had to change? For this to work, what had to change? This is the first thing that had to change, this person. Here I am, 46-year-old Brigadier General, when it starts, feeling very good about myself, and suddenly all the things that had made me feel good about myself and be effective were challenged and had to be reoriented. I had to lead differently. I had to listen to subordinates more. I had to follow subordinates more. And so in this, I like to think about things. When I experience something, I sort of like to step back and go, okay, what just happened? I like to get on a whiteboard and do this. So this is a depiction of the way I thought about it on a whiteboard. First, I said we start with materials. That's weapons or whatever materials we had talent, people, and then resources, money, and other resources that would give us an opportunity to be effective. Then we developed processes, and this was the force that I was in before 9-11. We had processes for everything. When I grew up in the Ranger Regiment, when you did physical training every day, you wore a physical training uniform. Your socks had to be plain white socks and go exactly halfway between your ankles and your knees. You had to sew little markers on the back of your hats with an exact stitch on each mark. The process became fanatically precise. And what we found was that focus on process, that focus on coordination, that focus on getting the assembly line perfect, that focus on making the airfield mission perfectly crafted. It really fed into our culture because your culture is who you are and what you do. Over time, you affect your culture and then your culture affects you. And so in this case, our process, good people, good stuff, our love of process, our love of checklists, our love of standard operating procedures, as we called it, fed our culture. So what was our culture? And that's really a question that I had to ask myself. Because in one sense, our culture was actually precise execution of processes. And you say, well, that's pretty good. I mean, it sounds right, doesn't it? We were good at it. We weren't just good as a grading scale. We were ridiculously good. We were anally good. Our culture became being the best. But then we found we're very good, and we come up against competition. And the competition is different than we expect, and it's constantly changing. And we have other very good partners, other government agencies. And they're great, too. They follow their processes. But only when we bring them together, even if we're not all quite as good as we were because we had to give a little bit, do we become effective enough to deal with a challenge like this? So if you look back, we go and we create our culture. And this was what our culture was. Our culture was excellence. Now, again, I'd ask you, if someone told you that the culture of an organization you're in is excellence, how would you respond? Seems pretty positive. In search of excellence, we're excellent. I'm excellent, you're excellent. Together we're all excellent. I don't think it much matters because here's what the culture has to be. What we found was when we were sticking to our process and being excellent, we were losing. What we had to do was change the way we thought and operated so we would win. 
It didn't matter if our socks went exactly halfway between our ankles and our knees. It didn't matter whether each operation was carefully choreographed and beautiful. It only mattered if we won. In warfare, it's easy because you know if you win or lose. People die or they don't. Now, size, discipline, equipment, they still matter. Just because you get a, a culture of winning doesn't mean everything. Think about it. Think the Roman Empire. Think what Roman legions were like. Pretty daunting, pretty scary, because their discipline, their power. And the in the industrial age, the steel industry became really impressive. It almost defined how we thought about ourselves as an industrial giant. But guess what? As good as Rome's legions were, they weren't good enough for a different kind of challenge. And as good as the steel industry was, the American steel industry in the 70s and 80s died. And it only came back in a completely new form. So, where does that take us? Back to the power sweep. The guy in the middle is Jerry Kramer, a famous guard. And he led this very, very effective execution. But I would argue this wasn't coordinated. There was something more in this. Something more in a magical coach named Vince Lombardi. Because as good as they executed, they also had something intangible inside the organization that caused them to win. Leadership is interesting. When I was young, my father was a soldier, and I thought of leadership typically in uniform. If you look at this picture of George Washington and the Continental Army crossing the Delaware River on Christmas night in 19, or 1776, they are going in a very difficult time and did an operation that probably saved the American Revolution. When you look at that picture, you say, okay, who's the leader? Well, for years it was obvious to me. It's George Washington, because he's not rowing. <laughs> but you really can't tell who the leader in that picture is. Any more than you can tell the leader in an organization by superficial titles, parking spaces, amount of money they make, et cetera. It's how they affect the organization. And George Washington went on to become an iconic leader, not because he was a leader who was particularly brilliant on the battlefield. What he did is he evoked, he evoked from soldiers a greater level of commitment. And he took a ragtag army with the help of the French and defeated Great Britain won the independence of America. So here's sort of my takeaway. It's not enough to be great. Excellence in itself doesn't really matter. You have to be good together. And I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.